Hey, my name is Nathan LaValle. Welcome to Theology for Teens. In this episode, I'm going to be showing you an excerpt from a teaching I gave a group of teenagers right after they had a spiritual mountaintop experience. Now, this is something that has been occurring in my life for the past several years. I work full-time as a youth pastor, and that means that I get to see front row and center God move in the lives of teenagers. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, when God moves, the shifts and the changes that God wants to create in people's lives, teenagers' lives, oftentimes get thwarted by the enemy. This going home speech that I'm going to be showing you is something that has been profoundly impactful and something that I've been perfecting over the last several years. If you've ever had a spiritual mountaintop experience and you've walked away from that and a few weeks later fallen away, this may be the message that you needed and the message you need today. So we're going to be taking a look today at this message. If you haven't already, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can see more content like this in your feed daily. You can also look at the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to get more content there as well. Thanks. Let's check it out. It has been an incredible weekend. God has absolutely moved. Have you seen God? Raise your hand if you've seen God this weekend. That is really cool. Guys, the Holy Spirit is with us. We know more about Him now. That He is our comforter, our helper, our convictor. That when Jesus left, He knew that something even better was coming. And that was the Holy Spirit. Now, at the end of every retreat we do, we have this moment now. It's been a tradition ever since the first retreat I planned when I was 21. And that was going homewards. I never prepare these lessons ahead of time because I know that for each retreat and each group, these words need to be a little bit different. Although oftentimes there's similar themes. And so I have four main things that I want to share with you this morning. When I was praying about this earlier, I felt these things just kind of come to my mind and and some specifics crop up on these things. Let me tell you. The very first thing is that you have a burden and a responsibility leaving this place. Anytime you encounter God, you have the same job as the job that the woman at the well does so well. She encounters God, and what does she do? She runs back to the city, and she tells everyone what she experienced. The burden of an encounter with God is that you cannot keep it to yourself. That is not allowed. When you encounter God, you must share it with the people around you. And I'll tell you what, (laughs) at every one of these points, the enemy is going to attack and the enemy is going to try to prevent it. Now, let me put some meat on the bones of this. When you get home, you have a responsibility to share with your parents how you saw and met God at this retreat. You have a responsibility to tell your siblings how you saw and met God at this retreat. Maybe you have young siblings who are seven or eight or or three. You have a responsibility to tell them how you encountered God at this retreat. When you're at church on Sunday and one of our elderly church members comes up to you and says, how was the youth retreat? You have two options. You can give them a fake answer. Oh, yeah, it was, it was nice. Or you can be real with them. You know what? I encountered the Holy Spirit in a new and powerful way. Can I tell you about it? You know what they're going to do? They're going to flip a lid. And they're going to be like, yes, please, tell me about it. Guys, these kinds of moments where a group of people meet God are moments that can change everyone else around them. With all the people in this room, we are probably closely interconnected to hundreds of people. And you guys have the power to make the impact of this retreat not just be the people in this room, but for the impact of this retreat to be the hundreds of people we're connected with. So when you leave this place, you need to know that you have a burden and a responsibility if you encountered God. And so when you get in the car, your parents are going to be like, how was it? Probably not the greatest question. I'd probably wait and let my kids sleep a little bit. 
before I ask that. But you can't choose when they ask that. Now, maybe you have the energy and you say, you know what, can I tell you a couple things that happened? We went out on this dock at nighttime and the stars and the moon were out and I felt God. And I stepped forward in front of everyone and I bawled my eyes out and I talked about this. Or maybe it was in worship. We sang this song and it says, your mercy triumphs over judgment, love wider than horizon. And I just started crying right then and there and I felt God in that room. Whatever it is, you might share with them then or you know what, you could tell them, you know, I'm gonna tell you everything about it, <laughs> but I'm pretty tired right now. Is it okay if I tell you about it later? And I think most of your parents would probably accept that. They'd say, you know, okay, yeah. But later you have to really tell them about it. When you do this, it can have huge positive impacts. When you tell your parents, it means the next time we have a youth retreat, they're gonna make sure you're here. They're gonna iron it out in your schedule for you. When you tell your friends, it means that later, and we're gonna to get to this point, when you invite them, they're more likely to come. They've had time to think about it. The Holy Spirit has time to work in them between now and then. So I want you to know that every time we encounter God, every time for your life that you encounter God, there is a burden to share it with the world. Each of you I task with this mission. You are missionaries in this sense. To leave this place and not hoard the wealth that you've received from the Holy Spirit, but to share it freely. Do you understand? Do you take this mission? The second point is imagination. Who here has good imagination? <laughs> Anyone still have their childlike imagination? Anyone lost their childlike imagination? I want to invite you to imagine with me something. This facility is incredible. There is so much space to spread out and do things here. Now, there's 65 beds in this place. We could sleep 65 people here. This dining hall has enough tables and chairs to feed 65 people. What would it look like for us to do a youth retreat where I have to rent a bus to get everyone out here? What would it look like for us to do a youth retreat where we literally don't have room in this building to set up for worship, and so we have to set up an outdoor pavilion for worship? And we bring our whole sound system, and maybe we do worship, you know, at that point, we do worship with tracks, and we do it really well like at camp this last year. And we invite people out from the church to do worship really, really well. What would that look like? Do you think that kind of worship could change your friends' lives? This kind of encounter, could it change your friends' lives? I want you to imagine with me what it would look like for these cabins to be filled with people. For us to have to be more creative in our scheduling for showering, that we have to have five or six shower blocks during the day that people can pull away and shower. What would it look like for us to do this and you guys to speak into the scheduling? Maybe we do more sports out here. Maybe we have a water balloon war out here. Maybe we bring out gel blasters and have a massive gel blaster war out here. Can you imagine this? Close your eyes. Think about this facility. Think about your friends. Think about the people that didn't get to go on this retreat from our youth group. You know, think about the friends that you think would never come to something like this. Can you imagine this place filled with 50 kids? Can you imagine us pulling a charter bus out here filled with 50 kids? Can you imagine it? Can you see a vision of it? Give me a thumbs up if you can imagine it, if you can see a vision of it. Go ahead and open your eyes. I can see it. I'll tell you something. 
at the prosopolimpsia retreat that we did, do you know how many students we had out there? Total with the adults, we had over 40 people. Student-wise, we had about 30 people. Now, why did so many people come to that retreat? Do you guys know? It was your first big retreat. We did Quench the year before. Nope. Good guess, though. <laughs> I'm not shaming you. Good guess, but that's not what it was. Some people, who stepped up? Uh, Daniel. Daniel stepped up. Now, I know some other people stepped up too. But Daniel brought 10 friends on that retreat. You know what Daniel did? <laughs> he and I talked about this. He sat down at his computer and he wrote out a script. He typed it out. Here's how I'm going to invite my friends. Last year I was at this retreat and this incredible thing happened. I want you to come to this retreat. I think it could change your life. I know you might not believe in God. I know you might not care about him. I know you might be disconnected from him. I want you to come to this retreat. I could ask him to send me the script he sent out for that retreat that he sent literally to every friend he had. Even the ones he thought, there's no chance they're coming. And guess what? Several of them came. Several of them were impacted for the gospel. And it was because Daniel was willing to shoot the shot on that. What he did, he texted it out to everyone and then he followed up. And he called these friends. When he saw them at school, he said, hey, have you signed up for the retreat yet? You, no, I haven't. You really got to sign up for the retreat. He was very focused on this. Guys, you all have that power. But you have to take it with boldness. I promise you, if all of you did that, if all of you were that focused and that bold, we would fill out this retreat center on the next retreat we did. If each of you invited all of your friends with that veracity, this place would be full. We'd probably have to turn people away because of the limit of beds we have here. Ice. And there's an ice maker. It's awesome. Do you guys see the vision? Do you see how it is not a fantasy, but it's true imagination, something that could really take place, that you guys have the power to make happen, but hey, I can't make it happen. <laughs> I can't go around inviting kids to my retreat. It's creepy, okay? Okay, I can't do it. I've tried. It doesn't work, okay? I can't in Walmart go, hey, you should come to this retreat I'm doing. Like, who are you? It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work, man. But you know what? You can do that. You can invite your friends to this retreat. And we're going to plan another one of these for after the summertime. And we're going to plan it here. And I'm going to reserve this place. And we're going to run it. So you guys don't just have a mission to tell others about what you've experienced. You have a mission to get other people here for the next one. And I'm telling you, with these 12 here, I know like, you guys have friends that you've never thought of inviting to something like this. If you invited all of them, what could happen? Now I think about, you know, how many of you have seen the Four Guys, One God YouTube channel that Cooper and Cohen and the boys are, okay. We posted that video. No subscribers. But the four of you, what'd you do, Cooper? You sent it to everyone, right? And the next day at school, what happened? Yeah, but what else happened from that? Um, you know how many views that video is at right now? It's just under a thousand that that video was viewed. And it was because you guys were willing to use your relational capital. What I mean by that is you were willing to use your relationships, your friendships, as a means of bringing people God. That channel has over 100 subscribers now. More subscribers than my channel. I don't have the power that you guys have in this regard. 
Use your power for God. Okay? All right, we got two points left. Third point. If you have not given your life to God formally, if you have not been baptized, I need to be very clear on what you're missing. If you have not given your life to God in baptism, if you have not stepped into the water, Peter tells us what we're missing. Okay? When he preaches to the Jews in Acts chapter 2, it says they're cut to the heart by the message of the gospel. How many of you have felt that this week? Cut to the heart. Have you felt that? It's like emotional. They felt emotional. Have you experienced that? They felt cut to the heart. And so they said, Peter, what should we do? Peter's response is this. Repent and be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And this is the big part. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we can debate and talk about whether baptism is necessary for salvation all day long. Okay, I'm not going to get into that. What I am going to get into, because it's certain and it's definitive, is that it's when you are baptized. That is the time that the Holy Spirit comes and you received Him as a gift. He indwells you and encourages you for the rest of of your life, when you formally declare, God, I'm giving my life to you, that is when the Holy Spirit says, you've opened your door to me and I can make home in your heart. And what that means, it is so powerful. It means you have a new identity. Some of you don't have that right now. You can be surrounded by the Spirit. You can be washed in the Spirit. You can be forgiven of your sins. But you do not have the Spirit within you yet. That Spirit within you is a still small voice that will comfort you in times of trouble. That spirit within you will say, you know what, you think you're bad? No, 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 I've made you good. That spirit within you is a companion that will always be with you, will never forsake you. And if you have not given your life to God in baptism, that gift is awaiting you. That gift is right there for you to reach out and grab. We've talked about this a lot. Do not wait to engineer the right moment to give your life to God. Do not wait for camp to give your life to God if you're ready to give your life to God now. What that will do, if you wait, if you try to engineer the perfect moment, guess what? It will never come. If you wait for the emotional high, guess what? It won't last. And so it's in a moment of rational thought where you say, you know what? I give my life to God. I want to do that. I want to do it formally. I want the Holy Spirit inside me that you should immediately say, I want to get baptized. Help me figure that out. Let's do it in a way that's going to be meaningful that I'll remember the rest of my life. And we will make that happen. And so if you're ready to get baptized, I want to encourage you in the next week to come talk to me about that. To give your life to God in a new way. To have the Holy Spirit inside you telling you who you are for the first time. That is a powerful thing. Finally, you need to be aware, and this is the fourth point, and there, there, there have been tie-ins on this with all the other points, that when you leave here, Satan will attack you. When you leave here, Satan will attack you. And I'll, I'll be as clear as I can. I believe that there are supernatural forces that you cannot see that are very near. I believe that the enemy is a real thing. It's not just some metaphor for the bad parts of us. It's not just some metaphor or a made-up story. The enemy is very real. There are demons. There are unclean spirits. And there is a leader of them called Satan or Lucifer who rules these powers. When you leave this place, they are going to initiate some sort of plan to convince you this was not real. Now, the reason that this hasn't happened yet is because we have been in constant prayer as adults. The volunteers here literally praying domes of protection over you, literally praying that if there have been any evil spirits that you guys have brought here that have been with you, that they would not be allowed in this place. We cast them out. We rebuke them in the name of Jesus. But when you leave this place, when you expose yourself to other people in other environments that are not protected like this, doubt can start to seep in. And you might start going, it wasn't real. 
you might start to go, I just was really emotional. That wasn't God. You might start to go, those people who were there didn't really care about me. You might start to say, I don't belong with that group of people. You might start to say, all the stuff about the Holy Spirit, it's confusing still. And in many ways, these can be attacks of the enemy. Because the enemy is going to want to invalidate the powerful experiences you have with God. That's what the enemy has done since the dawn of creation. That is what the enemy did in the garden with Adam and Eve. That is what the enemy tried to do with Jesus. The way you combat that is you hold fast to Scripture and God's Word, just like Jesus did. To every temptation, there was a response from Scripture. Jesus quoted. And it focused on the power and goodness of God. But in being aware of the enemy's attack, it loses half of its power. So when you leave this place and you get home and immediately your brother is fighting with you, let's just say, or immediately your little sister is chasing you with scissors or something like that, okay? Or immediately your parents are getting on your case. Did you finish your home? Step back. Mom, you're the enemy. No, I'm just kidding. Don't say that. No, no, no. Don't say that. Don't say that. But, but be aware that the enemy will use whatever means necessary to get at you. Okay, the, the enemy will use things that are well-intentioned to get at you. And where, where the enemy is is not in your mom. The enemy is not like, go tell her to get her homework done. The enemy is in you interpreting that and hearing that a certain way and it rattling you. Step back. No. Nope. She just wanted me to get my homework done. Get my homework done. It's okay. This weekend was worth it. Like, we're here. God has done a great thing here. I am so thankful that I got to witness it. And all of these four things are things that I'm going to do with you. That I will witness to other people. I will invite as many students in our church as I can to the next one of these. I will watch the enemy's attack in my life. I'll be ready for it. And I'll talk with you about baptism. That's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you can engage down in the comment section below. Or like I said, make sure to like and subscribe. Follow the podcast. Leave a five-star review. Fulfill your role as an online evangelist. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed getting a backseat view at what it looks like at the end of the youth retreats that I typically lead. Thanks for watching. This has been Theology for Teens with Nathan Valley. See you in the next one. Bye.